Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Chatham House. A uh, very warm welcome to Arseniy Yatsenyuk, Prime Minister of Ukraine, uh, who's going to be speaking to us today about transforming Ukraine, successes and obstacles on the way to reform. Um, I should say to you that uh, this meeting is on the record. It's also being live streamed and people can comment through Twitter using hashtag CH events and hashtag Ukraine forum. And can I ask you now please to silence your mobile phones. This event uh, is taking place as part of the new Ukraine Forum at Chatham House, which was launched just last week. Uh, but in effect, this is uh, an even bigger and better launch. We're delighted that the Prime Minister can be here with us. Chatham House decided that it would be a good idea to have a Ukraine Forum because although it has really, to a large extent, dropped out of the international media, uh, the crisis is still very far from over. There's a great deal going on in Ukraine, which we're going to hear about from the Prime Minister today. And we thought it was important for Chatham House and the people involved with it to be able to look at Ukraine on its own merits, not look at it through the prism of somebody else's views or through somebody else's eyes. And the focus of the forum is particularly on what's happening inside Ukraine, the process of reform, that very difficult, very complicated process, um, where we need to understand better what is happening and how we in this country and elsewhere can help in that process. Now, this session is going to last for one hour until seven o'clock. And the Prime Minister is going to just start off in conversation with me, and then he's agreed to take questions from the floor. And I should start just by introducing him. Um, he has worked throughout his professional career as a lawyer, an economist, a banker, and he's held a number of high-profile positions, including as head of the National Bank of Ukraine and parliamentary speaker. I think when we met, uh, Prime Minister, you were Minister of Economy, and I was ambassador in Ukraine, and I remember you telling me about economic pressures from Russia on, on Ukraine. So some things, 10 years ago. some things don't change. Yeah. And since then, uh, Mr. Yatsenyuk has been Foreign Minister, Speaker of the Parliament, and then last year he launched a new People's Front Party, and since February last year he has been Prime Minister. So, delighted to have you here. My pleasure. Mr. Yatsenyuk, we look forward to hearing from you. Well, distinguished Ambassador, distinguished audience, it's a pleasure to address you. You know, there is an old joke. I am from the Ukrainian government here to help you. This time I am from the Ukrainian government to answer any question you have. It's so important for me to deliver you the real information, what's on the ground. Because my country is uh, facing tremendous challenges. And uh, sometimes one can say that these challenges are insurmountable. But we succeeded, we survived, and we are moving. We are moving, making reforms painful, tough, and we need your support, we need take, your take on the situation in Ukraine, your advice, and I'll appreciate any questions you have. So, let's go down to business. Okay. Well, let, let me just kick it off. Um, it seems to me that one of the major problems that's faced Ukraine ever since independence in 1991 has been corruption in, in the country. And this has been holding back Ukraine, and it's been a very common complaint uh, that there's been mismanagement, that under a series of different governments, money has been diverted. So Ukraine has not been able to prosper as it should have done. Since the revolution last year, you've got a new opportunity. What are you doing? What is your government doing, really, seriously to tackle corruption, not just talk about it, but actually do something about it? Well, I want to have a very open discussion. If I say you that we already eradicated and tackled corruption in Ukraine, this is not true. 
And the same goes not only in Ukraine. Similar cases we have even in the European Union. So this is a very bumpy and long road. But let me talk only about facts. Uh, first of all, most rampant corruption existed in the energy sector of Ukraine. Mainly it was so-called gas corruption. We succeeded in eliminating gas corruption and in eliminating middlemen in Ukrainian energy sector. There is one of the biggest state-owned enterprises, which is Ukrainian Naftogaz gas company, that had a very shadow and intransparent deals with middlemen and with the Russian Federation. So last year, uh, we eliminated this middleman. His name is Mr. Firtash. He is under FBI investigation and expected to be extradited to the United States. And for today, we have just direct deals with the European companies uh, no kicks off, kicks in, kicks out, just uh, very clear pricing on the market-based level. Uh, so we hammered out the deal with Russians last year. It was a trilateral deal, Ukraine, EU and Russian Federation. So I want uh, to indicate that real success that Ukraine achieved is to make gas sector really transparent. The next step is that the uh, Ukrainian government took over the control of another huge oil company, which is Ukrnafta. And uh, we expect uh, to mitigate the roles of Ukrainian tycoons in this company. And we expect to have a new transparently elected CEO on the 22nd of July this year. The sad issue is uh, we do have high profile and petty corruption. Uh, for the first uh, time in the Ukrainian history, the Ministry for Emergency Service and his first deputy were arrested during the meeting of the cabinet. Uh, but the problem is that uh, uh, we arrested, Homeland Security Department arrested them, but in two days they were released on bail by uh, absolutely entirely independent Ukrainian judges and uncorrupted Ukrainian judges. Uh, <coughs> The government uh, established an anti-corruption bureau. Uh, it, and the chair or director of anti-corruption bureau was elected uh, by a special selection commission, absolutely independent, and the president signed an executive order to appoint a uh, new director of uh, this independent agency. So we expect to have up to 250 detectives uh, that will launch a large-scale investigations against high-profile Ukrainian officials. The parliament passed a number of bills. For example, uh, as for today, all public servants, mainly like ministers, members of the cabinet, prosecutors, judges, they are obliged to disclose all assets, all uh, sources of their uh, both expenditures and revenues. So for the first time it happened when all the Ukrainian public servants are to disclose their tax and revenue information. Um, the parliament a few days ago uh, lifted an immunity over uh, a number of judges. And these judges were arrested, but once again another judges released them on bail. Uh, so we, we are doing, the process is very complicated. So let me focus on the few issues that uh, needs to be done. The first one is a comprehensive judicial reform. And there is a problem. The idea I have personally is to introduce a sweeping reform in the entire Ukrainian judiciary. We cannot cope with these kind of judges. We have just to change the entire court system. But, you know, we have our European friends and the Venice Commission, and they say, look, this is unconstitutional. You have to stick to the rule of law. You have to change judges in the appropriate manner. This won't work. My idea is just to hire new judges. Uh, the second issue is to deregulate Ukrainian economy. And a lot uh, has been done. In, uh, if you have the big government, you have big corruption. The smaller government, smaller corruption. So we uh, overhauled the tax system, uh, we lifted a number of uh, Soviet-style regulations. Uh, we, we are doing everything to create level playing fields for the Ukrainian and international investors and uh, to make business environment as friendly as possible. Uh, another problem which needs to be addressed is extremely low wages and salaries. You can't tackle corruption having, for example, 
an average salary in the public sector $100. This won't work. And uh, mm, too much depends on the way Ukrainian economy is to develop. As today we are on the huge slide, you know, that we lost about 20% of Ukrainian economy due to illegal annexation of Crimea and Russian invasion. So, corruption is the key issue, and when we were in D.C., U.S. Vice President Joe Biden and President Obama and uh, all our international friends and partners, they are very clear that corruption is the key priority. So, we, and contrary, I ask uh, Americans, uh, David Cameron and uh, Prime Minister Harper, to send uh, his folks to train Ukrainian Homeland Security Department, to train Ukrainian detectives, just to make them, I would say, vibrant, to make them strong enough to investigate at all these anti-corruption cases. And last but not least, uh, I just told you I mentioned about this first, uh, about the Ministry of uh, Emergency Service and his first deputy. When they were arrested during the search, uh, Homeland Security Department investigators, they found credit cards, you know, bank accounts and the rest of the stuff. And we asked one European country to give us an additional proofs and evidences, whether these bank accounts are true or not true, just to provide us with the information. I've been waiting for three months and we didn't get any response from one EU member state. So my message to uh, our European friends, help us. Help us in eradicating and tackling corruption. Let's track down and recover all assets of former regime and even this government. Prime Minister, one of the unusual approaches of your government is to uh, bring in people from other countries. Uh, to, to be members of your government and to help you. And indeed, uh, recently, Mikhail Saakashvili, who was head of government in Georgia, has been appointed uh, governor of Odessa region. Um, do you think so far this is proving a, a, a successful approach? And, and how, how is that um, perceived in Ukraine, among Ukrainians, that you're bringing in these foreigners to help run the country? Ambassador, I would be happy if you consider this idea too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll keep that under consideration. <laughs> uh, look, I am really satisfied with the Ukrainian team of uh, very pro-reformist folks in the government. We have very brilliant ministers. They are young. This is, this is another type of people. Uh, Natalia Yarescu, who is the uh, Secretary of Treasury, it's just, she's just amazing. She's doing her job and this country never had minister like Natalia. Minister for Economy, he's great. He started this deregulation, he called it uh, deregulation guillotina. <laughs> to kill all this, his aim is to kill all this uh, Soviet-style red tape and uh, Ukrainian bureaucracy. Uh, so, I am really delighted with the new government and with the new cabinet. But, we have perfect Ukrainians. They are great ones. For example, Ukrainian trade representative. It was she who hammered out the deal, FTA deal, with Canada. Yesterday we signed with Prime Minister Har Harper this deal and she is so professional, she is so bright, she is so decisive, and she committed to deliver changes uh, that uh, the idea we have in the government is that to comprise both foreigners, Ukrainians, and just to make a dream team, dream team for real reforms. I'll ask you one more question, then I'll let our audience uh, ask their questions. You referred earlier to uh, the gas industry, and which had been ripe for corruption. Um, that has been a problem, but Ukraine has been quite successful in the last two years or so at reducing its consumption of gas in having a much more varied group of, of suppliers. And yet, at the same time, you imposed much higher taxes on companies within Ukraine which were producing gas. So was that not a bit of an own goal, that you were making it more difficult to produce gas in Ukraine? Uh, the bad news is that we increased royalties and taxes in energy sector six months ago. The good news is that 
yesterday we decided to slash royalties and taxes in the energy sector. And I will have a huge debate in the parliament because this will, they will definitely politicize this issue saying that look, uh, the government decided uh, to slash the royalties, this will severely impact the revenues, you support energy tycoons, oligarchs, that's not true. The idea we have is simple as it is. We want to have Ukraine entirely energy independent. And the way to increase the output capacity of Ukrainian energy sector is just to provide incentives. I do understand that for the government in the short-term perspective, it's better to get more revenues. But this is a short-term perspective. As I see the decline in the output due to high royalties. So we decided uh, uh, to slash by two times all royalties uh, uh, and taxes. And uh, mm, I expect that in 10 years, Ukraine will be entirely energy independent due to two reasons. The first one, more extraction, and the second one is energy efficiency programs. I will tell you, for example, the data. Uh, Ukraine consumes in average about 50 billion BCM of natural gas. Poland, Polish consumption is 13 billion BCM. But GDP of Poland is just four times bigger than Ukraine. It's unacceptable, just unacceptable to heat the atmosphere. That's what's going in our country. Uh, we need an investment both in drillings, in new wells, and in energy efficiency program. And uh, this is a matter of our discussion with our European and American friends. Um, going back to the issue you said on the energy, um, last year we did a lot in order to launch the reverse flow. Because you know that we were entirely and heavily dependent on Russia. Uh, in 2013, the volume of gas that was purchased from the Russian Federation was about 90 or 95 percent. This year, we shifted from the Russian market to the EU market, and we buy from the EU more than 70 percent of natural gas. So we launched a reverse flow, uh, we diversified the routes, and uh, we brought Russia to international co commercial tribunal uh, on the gas deal uh, with the lawsuit of 16 billion dollars and uh, we have very ch very high chances to win this case Great. let's take some questions from the audience um, please can you wait for a microphone to come and then when I call you can you please give your name and say who you are and keep your questions short. So, first one over there, please. Um, <clears throat> my name's Bobo Lowe. I'm an associate fellow with the Russia and Eurasia program here at Chatham House. Uh, Prime Minister, I'd like to push you a little bit more on the Saakashvili appointment, if I may. Um, I realize that you're not personally behind the appointment of uh, former Georgian President Saakashvili as governor of Odessa. But perhaps you could give us some insights on <coughs> the thinking that was behind the appointment and also how you see the short to medium term outlook for Odessa within Ukraine. Uh, my thinking is that the cabinet asked the president and the president signed an executive order and Saakashvili became the governor. Just simple as it is, and we expect that Mr. Saakashvili is to deliver real changes in Odessa, and I am at his disposal. And not only on his, on everyone who wants to reform in this country. What special qualities does he bring? He's the former president. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have the former president, the governor of one of the biggest Ukrainian regions. At the back there, please. There is no former president, just the president. <laughs> uh, I'm Ian Bond from the Center for European Reform. Uh, Prime Minister, when you were in Washington, you described some of the populist uh, members of the RADA uh, as lunatics. I think some of them actually come from, from your own party. But it does seem that some of the laws that they're passing risk interfering with uh, the, the IMF program and so on. So can you tell us what you're planning to do to get them back into line and to ensure that the, the RADA doesn't block some of the necessary reforms? Well, 
sometimes it happens with the politicians, they go crazy before elections. So we are to have uh, municipal elections on the 25th of October this year. And I have a very good example for lunatics, not only in Ukraine, but in different countries, including some EU member states. Look, to pass austerity is definitely unpopular. If you go to your people saying, my fellow citizens, we are decided to frozen all social expenditures, wages and salaries. That's what I did. We have to increase by six times communal tariff bill. We need to impose new taxes. We need to close tax loopholes. You have to work more in order to get more. This is very unpopular, but in the short term. Look what Prime Minister Cameron did a few years ago. You in the UK passed austerity, right? He was under severe attacks by his political opponents. And he hit the home run. He won the elections. And this is the best example. So if you think about the future, if you do everything to build up the prosperous country, and if you don't care about your own political dividends, for the statesman it's important to pay the price, the political price, to spend the political currency, but for the future of the country. And this is the message I always deliver to uh, my friends in the parliament. I admire the parliament. Um, Yes, it's true that some political forces want to roll back on the reform agenda. But we are united with the president. And even in case if any populistic bill will be on the floor and the government will pass this bill, the president will definitely veto it. No chances to stop reforms. Um, we've entirely changed the record of our relations with the IMF. Well, it's better for you to ask the IMF because I can't uh, uh, say on the side of the IMF and, for example, G7 ministers. Everything that we promised, we delivered. Ukrainian people have suffered too much, and they are suffering. Living standards drop severely, very high inflation, huge depreciation. So it's, it's a huge challenge. But from day to day, we are talking to the Ukrainian people. We ask them to be patient and to do everything for the brighter future of this country. And people are much more, I would even say, mature. They have the wisdom, contrary to some Ukrainian politicians. But we will change these politicians. The gentleman at the front here, please. The microphone's just coming. There we are. Hello, Steve Erlanger from the New York Times. Privet. When you took the it's not Privet. Ukrainsky, it's Dobry Deň. Do <laughs> Privet, that's... Dobry Deň. <laughs> when you took the job, you said it was a suicide task. So I'm glad to see you're still alive and kicking. But what I was hoping you would do was give us a sense of how the war is going. Um, because it's, it's, it's difficult, as you know, and sometimes a bit dangerous to get onto the front lines. Um, what do you think the separatist goals really are? Is this frozen or is it unfreezing? Has it ever stopped? Where is it going? And um, are, are you concerned? There have been lots of reports of um, Russian military buildup of supplies and aid to the separatists. So if you could just give us a sense, your sense of where things are now, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, this is one of the most complicated questions and there is no easy answer and one can say that even there is no answer at all if if I may to ask you let's just avoid the language of separatists there are no separatists there are just Russians and Russian led terrorists and this is the right legal definition because Russia is personally engaged Russia masterminded and orchestrated illegal annexation of Crimea, this is the fact. This is an international crime. 
uh, there is a word that Russia is to pay the price. You know, usually we pay the price in the supermarket. Russia is to be punished by the international law for the illegal annexation of Crimea. And for me, this is both political and personal issue. I was Minister for Economy in Crimea. And all these rumors that there were entirely pro-Russian sentiments in Crimea, that's not true. So, what we have on the table? The only deal which is still viable is so-called Minsk deal. Is it fine the time to elaborate on this? Because you raised the hand. If you want to get the answer on what's going to happen in future in terms of uh, Russian-led invasion. Uh, we do understand that Russia is not willing to implement the Minsk deal. But the policy of the president of Ukraine and of the Ukrainian government is as follows. We are whiter than white in implementing Minsk. What the president promised, we did. The president promised to sign an executive order, a ceasefire order, he did it. We passed an amnesty bill, he signed it. We passed a bill on the special status of Donetsk and Lugansk, it is enacted. Uh, we promised to start constitutional amendments and the president is to address the House tomorrow with his constitutional amendments which are in line with the Minsk deal. And I do understand that what Russia wants Russian play is to blame Ukraine for not implementing the deal and saying, look, that's Ukraine who failed. That's the reason why we drop off this deal. No chances to no avail. We will be the last one who is to say that Minsk is dead. No. There are fingerprints of President Putin on the Minsk deal. So he is obliged to implement the deal, and uh, uh, Madam Merkel, Chancellor Merkel, and President Olan, they contributed a lot of their political capital into this deal. They did a lot to make this deal happen. And we are to stay united and to act in concert in, in, to make Russia to implement and fulfill the deal. What is the aim of Putin? Definitely not to make Ukraine happy. His aim is to resume something that resembles Soviet Union. His aim is to take over Ukraine. His aim is to dismantle Ukraine as a nation, as a, as a country. What's happening in Ukraine is not just related to us. This is the global challenge. It relates to everyone sitting in this room. Russia is the threat to global stability and security. This is not the way how P5 member can act. They have to change their policy, or we have to change their policy, and to, to, to get one united, strong policy towards Russia. The only language Putin understands is strength. So, let's be strong. Prime Minister, as a follow-up to that, we've had a question on Twitter which is asking do you think a formal takeover of those areas that's the occupied areas of Ukraine by Russian forces is likely a formal takeover uh, it's complicated for me to distinguish what does it mean formal and informal what we know is that Russia stationed about 40,000 military boots on the ground. 10,000 of which are Russian regular army military boots. Uh, the only person who denies Russian presence in Ukraine is President Putin. So, if they have free internet, they can provide him with the footage from internet when they deliver tanks, artillery, howitzers, and even SA-11 and SA-22. Um, I've seen in uh, reports in the UK press, uh, British journalists discovered uh, stationed uh, SA-11 near Lugansk. It was a picture in the internet. So, 
Russia violated an international law illegally annexing Crimea, and Russia invaded Donetsk and Lugansk. These are Russian regular troops and Russian-led terrorists, and Russia is responsible for all this mass and international crime that this, they committed. Yes, but in the case of Crimea, Russia has annexed it. In the case of Donbass, the occupied areas, it, it has not. It's not formally absorbed it, has it? And I will tell you why. They don't want to donate or actually to pay the real value price. Because Donetsk and Lugansk was heavily subsidized by the central government. We paid billions of dollars to these areas. I will tell you, for example, the number. Last winter, we spent one billion U.S. dollars to supply gas and electricity to these areas. And this one billion is in arrears. So this is a depressed region. And Putin doesn't want to take it, because he does understand that uh, this will be, he is to bear the financial brunt. He needs another billions of dollars to support these Russian-led terrorists. And uh, due to the huge slide in oil prices, uh, Russian economy is definitely not in the best shape in the world. Okay, um, gentlemen here, can we have a microphone, please? Uh, Ronan Tynan. Uh, first of all, Prime Minister, I must uh, congratulate you on your efforts. Uh, you certainly have a, a thankless task, so it's a very challenging role. But it's just about the economy, I must ask you. But first of all, are you suggesting that the lack of transparency in the European Union in relation to financial matters is actually aiding corruption in the Ukraine? Because you said you're still waiting three months from a particular EU country, and I'm sure I'm not the only one in the audience who would love to know the name of that country in terms of your efforts in combating corruption. But the second point I must ask you is in relation to the austerity program you're necessarily being forced to run. You know, given the demographic crisis, the fall in population between 2014 and 2015, which some even speculate could be way over 250,000 people, which is a huge drag on your economy, which is a challenge to any conventional austerity program, number one. And obviously you made the point about the fall in demand as a result of losing Crimea and the general lack of, of confidence. And the other point, which our president is very worried about on the record, is the spread of arms from the east to the west and the rising terrorism across the country, which again has a huge effect on your economy. I just want to put it to you. Against that background, clearly it's very important to maintain the Ukrainian economy. And is the conventional austerity program the right approach? It's not just for you, obviously, but it's for Ukraine's friends to address, because it doesn't seem to make sense to me. Thank you very much. So is a conventional economic austerity approach the right one in these very complex circumstances? Mm -hmm. uh, not sure I can address the first question on corruption in the EU. We strongly believe that uh, EU is in entirely uncorrupted. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and we have to rely on the EU support to eradicate and tackle corruption in Ukraine. On the austerity, we had two options. And that's the way I try to explain it to the Ukrainian people. The first one is to get another painkiller to buy some pills and to be happy for no more than a few months. Then we, are, we will run out of cash and we will get both pain and kill. There is another option which is much more difficult and complex is to pass austerity and to heal the body, to make the country strong, to make the country viable, and to make Ukra Ukrainian economy robust. What kind of resources we can attract? Going to private creditors and saying, look, uh, the government decided to issue another billions of treasury bills. Probably this is possible, but the yield and the interest rate will, would be just skyrocketing. And this is the way for real insolvency and bankruptcy. And frankly speaking, not sure that uh, private investors would be happy to lend to Ukraine. So difficult, it's, it's so complicated to attract private investors already having attracted Russian tanks in your country. Another source is the only one actually, is the international community. I mean, the IMF, the World Bank, 
and G7 contributors. So we've decided to relaunch the program with the IMF, and as I already told you, we have a very good record with the IMF. Under this program, Ukraine is to receive $17.5 billion in the forthcoming four years. And in addition to this, $7.5 billion from G7 member states and other contributors. So this is so-called IMF puzzle. So in this IMF puzzle, we are to get 25 billion US dollars. This is the first part. And another part is that the government started debt restructuring operation. Debt restructuring means uh, private creditors want to get more. We want to pay less. Under this debt restructuring operation, we expect to save up to $15 billion. Everyone knows in the world that it's not enough for Ukraine. But what, what, what kind of another options I have? No options at all. So it means that we have to pass the austerity, to pass necessary reforms, to show the progress, to ask for an additional support, to have an invest investment conference like we had in DC. And you know, the, ref the reflection of these international investors, they said, look, we, we are ready. They don't say that we are ready to invest, to jump in next day. But they said we are ready to contemplate and consider an idea to invest and to participate in, for example, large-scale privatization. And then to ask for more support from uh, the European Union, from the United States, in case if we deliver real progress and tangible results. This is the roadmap. But I do understand that, you know, it's, so, it's easy for me to talk, but it's so difficult for people to survive. And this won't last forever. People ask, they say, look, I, I met just ordinary people at Chernobyl uh, nuclear power plant, and they said, how long is it going to be? One, two years. We are ready to wait, but tell us. We see the light in the tunnel. What, what is the lens of this tunnel? And in this case, communication strategy, or just talking to the people, convincing them that this is the only chance this is the right way to follow, and we have to stay united in the parliament, and you have to stay shoulder by shoulder as a strong Ukrainian nation, and we will succeed. This is the only right strategy that we have undertaken. Over here, please. John Muff, I'm with the Russia and Eurasia program here at uh, Chatham House. Prime Minister, I wanted to ask you about one of the problems that's uh, dogged Ukraine over the last 25 years, and, and that is the, the quality of its administrative capacity. And I wonder what, what you're, you're doing, uh, the, the, the head of the government, to, to address this, because you, you've got armies of uh, civil servants, um, but the, the competence level often not very high, motivation level is very low, and you're talking about comprehensive reforms. Where does one begin? This is one of the biggest roadblocks on our way to real reforms. A lot has changed on the high-profile level, in the cabinet of ministers, in the presidential administration. But the thing is that, for example, you ask to do something, someone, but he doesn't have an experience, he doesn't have any incentives. He just doesn't want to change himself. Because changes start is not from the entire country. If everyone is to change himself, so this will change the entire country. Uh, a number of line ministers, they reshuffled their staff and they reshuffled ministers. But the problem is once again wages and salaries. We asked our European friends to establish a special fund. A support, a financial support fund for, pu for new public administration in Ukraine. We can change laws, we can change bills, we can change rules. But if we don't create incentives for the Ukrainian public servants, they won't work. So the first goal is to get financial support. Another one is to train, to train Ukrainian public uh, service. 
there are a number of uh, support programs established by the European Union, started with the twinning program and ending with the support group uh, that was sent by the EU to Ukraine. But this will take time too. And the third issue is education. Um, a separate educational program for the public service in Ukraine is to be established. We need trainers, we need uh, professors, we need those in know who can share the experience. Um, in these ministries and in these agencies where international uh, advisors work, a lot has changed. I am absolutely happy with the way, for example, uh, um, American and British uh, advisors worked. Uh, Americans are working on uh, GDF, this is on banking sector, on the fiscal service. Uh, British um, experts uh, supported us in uh, the sweeping reform of the IRS, of the tax service. A number of EU-based experts are engaged in uh, agricultural energy sector. But once again, uh, we have these three priorities, wages, education and training, and we need the EU support and the support of the free world to reshuffle and to overhaul Ukrainian public service. Question at the back by the wall there, please. Uh, thank you very much, Prime Minister. Um, the name's Ewan Grant. I'm the uh, former UK government intelligence analyst for the ex-Soviet states. I worked pre-Maidan and post-Maidan, um, long-term and short-term in Kiev. Um, my question is um, partly based on uh, Dr. Lowe's comments about the future developments in Odessa and um, take a, takes account of the New York Times article of early June, uh, very thought-provoking on the um, Moldovan embezzlement case. Um, which I think raises a lot of opportunities for Ukraine and in recovering monies. Um, what advice could you give to Western institutions, particularly but not exclusively the media, in countering the Russian propaganda that will come out, let's be blunt about it, lies, when the Netherlands report into the loss of a, um, the airliner comes out? Uh, because there will, in line with an earlier comment, there will be a lot of black propaganda, not all of it from the Russian Federation. Thank you. What we are facing, we are facing a new type of hybrid war. And... Uh, the ammunition and munition of this war is not just heavy artillery and tanks, but Goebbels-style propaganda, orchestrated by Russia, disseminated by the media. And uh, as far as I know, the EU already established a task force how to withstand this Russian propaganda, what to do with this. Because a lot has changed in the world. And uh, uh, what is black presented, sorry, what is white presented in the media as black? What is square presented as a novel? And Russians, they, they are the best one in making this. Um, so it seems that uh, the key problem today is uh, to find an appropriate response how to withstand this propaganda. Uh, the only chance is just to deliver the truth to deliver the truth, to have uh, meetings like this, to tell the truth uh, and to show that Russia and their anchors and their huge propaganda machine is just lying. Because uh, when I was in States, you know they have this TV channel RT Russia today and the majority of Americans, they don't know that this is the Russian uh, TV channel. Because, you know, they, they hired perfect anchors, native speakers, and just someone switch on the TV set sitting in, I don't know, in any hotel in D.C. or even in Europe, thinking that, look, this is the truth. They speak like we speak. Um, no difference between CNN, BBC, and Russia Today. Uh, I've got the report that Russia Today is the biggest world channel. 
with the biggest coverage. So let's do it together. I know that you have debate in uh, the United Kingdom over the future of BBC. Um, just do it, make it bigger, make it stronger and deliver the right messages. <laughs> Prime Minister, you'll make some people here in the BBC very happy to, to, to <laughs> hear that. There's a lady in the middle who's waiting to ask a question. Thank you very much. Elena Melikishvili, King's College, London. Um, sorry, sorry, could you give your name? Elena Melikishvili, King's College, London. I'm not going to ask about Georgian officials in oh, Kiev. Oh, please do it. <laughs> no, my question is about the uh, Ukrainian society, because if we go back to Georgia's uh, experience, society has to have a huge input in order to balance the reforming government so that to keep checks on it. So what I would like to ask, how is uh, the societal um, integration and how they participate in this? Because as we remember from the elections, uh, when Yanukovych became president, it was pretty much um, divided into two parts of, of Russia-oriented and Europe-oriented um, Ukraine. So how is it now? And how, what are your perspectives about it? Thank you very much. A lot has changed in my country. So before the revolution, we were just the people. After the revolution, we became the real nation. Before the revolution, one can say it was the territory. After the revolution, it became the country, the real strong one united country and one united nation. Uh, and you know, the society and Ukrainian people, this is, like, this is like the safeguard, not the safeguard, this is like a clearance point for Ukrainian politicians. Because if you do something wrong, media erupts, people are unhappy, politicians are under constant pressure, and they have to change, for example, their decisions. Um, I would even say that before the revolution, we have a division of powers, so-called normal, or conventional division of powers, the executive, legislative, and judiciary. For today, we can add the society, which is very strong, which is very committed, which asks for real deliverables and tangible results, which is unhappy with the government, this is normal, in every country, uh, but these people deserve more, much more. And to make Ukrainian future prosperous and bright, it's not just enough our endeavors and our efforts. I cannot name any country in the world who is confronting the challenges Ukraine has. We are fighting on the military front with Russians. We are fighting against corruption, against red tape, against insolvency, so too much on the table. And this is the case when the West and the free world is to realize if we build up a success story in Ukraine, this would be the right response to President Putin and to the Russian regime. The gentleman at the front has been waiting. Mohamed El Mujil, uh, member of Chatham House and senior advisor at Atlantic Pacific Capital. First of all, thank you, Prime Minister, for your time today. And uh, I applaud what you've mentioned about fighting corruption, and it's definitely, I think, the main priority. And you've mentioned a lot of landmark successes over corruption. However, the uh, sad fact is that corruption, despite it really trickling down very fast in any society, reversing it doesn't. And there is, even if you fix it at the top, there is usually mass corruption at the bottom that needs to be addressed in a very different way. I would love to hear your thoughts on how you are actually addressing that right now. Um, I already provided with the facts uh, how we eradicate corruption on the highest levels. But frankly speaking, I am entirely unhappy 
with the way we eradicate and tackle corruption. We are dragging our feet. And, well, there are an enormous problems in judiciary, in prosecutor's office, in Homeland Security Department. Let's not talk about the problems. Let's talk about the way how to fix the problems. We have a large-scale petty corruption on the level of the tax administration, customs office, um, public servants, public officials, so we have launched a sweeping reform in the IRS just to make it two times less to increase wages, to deregulate, uh, to make the way to administer taxes and to pay customs duties much more easier. And we even have an idea um, to ask what is the name of this company, Danilo? Uh, Crown Agent? Right. Th this, is, this, is, this is the UK company? Mm -hmm. Right, Crown Agent. Uh, to ask Crown Agent to operate a number of Ukrainian customs. Just to eradicate corruption. They, they did it well in Hungary. I, I'm not sure about the record, but they have quite good record. In, right, in the Balkans. Uh, so to eradicate this petty corruption in the customs office in the in the IRS the first issue is to uh, pass the reform in the IRS and another one is just to ask uh, some companies to operate Ukrainian customs and this will be the best sign saying that look look at this customs office for example in Odessa it is operated by crown agent and revenues increased by five times and look at another customs it dropped um, Wages and salaries, that's what I already indicated. We need to have an entirely independent prosecutor's office, and the president is really working on this. And last but not least, we need someone not just be arrested, but behind the bars, sitting in jail. And in this case, this is the best evidence and proof that things has changed. So I expect that Homeland Security Department is to send the, this court case about this minister, the first deputy minister, as quick as possible, and we expect for the court, court verdict, and this will be the first clear sign of a real quest against corruption. Right, we're coming towards the end of our session. I'm going to take three more questions, people who caught my eye. There's a lady there in the middle, please. And I'd like to take these... Can you put your hand up? Um, take these three questions together, just three short questions, and then ask the Prime Minister to, okay. to finish. So please, can you stand up? Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, my name is Natalia Prilutsk. I work for Amnesty International, but for Russia team, not the Ukraine team. Uh, my question is, I mean, very good words about the United Nations, uh, United Nation, Ukraine. Um, do you I don't have good words for the United Nations. No, no. <laughs> great. <laughs> Um, but do you, do you still consider people who live in the territories of Donetsk and Lugansk region under control of the separatists still part of your nation? And if yes, then why this separate treatment? Do you think that actually if effectively establishing economic blockade and you know, difficulties with passing onto the rest of the territory of Ukraine actually brings people, uh, makes people feel as they are united, part of the one nation? Or do you think this is actually pushing the, them away? Okay, thank you. So thank you. Just hold okay, that okay. question. Gentleman here in the second row. Thank you, Prime Minister. David Hardy, member of Chatham House. Uh, you've already mentioned the need for uh, qualified public servants and with their skills and knowledge to do the job to meet your reform agenda. What is your policy for the reform of, in particular, the technical and vocational institutions and the universities in order to produce the graduates, the future employees, and indeed to train the existing employees, not only of the public sector, but also the private sector? Thank you. And could you just pass the microphone that way? Thank you. Um, Andrew Alchin, member of Chatham House. Could you stand up, please? The United States and the United Kingdom signed the Budapest Memorandum. Would you welcome uh, the supply of arms 
from those two countries. Thank you. Do we have another hour? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Have as long as you've got, Brian. Okay. I strongly consider those who live in Donetsk and Lugansk a part of Ukrainian nation. They are Ukrainians. But they are hostages of Putin's regime. Once again, only, let's talk only about facts. The fact is that the government paid $1 billion for the energy supply to these areas. The fact is that we have 1.3 million people registered as IDPs. Just imagine, the entire Birmingham removed to London. Just, just imagine what, what would happen in the UK. We are to pay social entitlement programs for them, wages and pensions. About 1 million out of this 1.3 already received their pensions. The sad issue is that we facilitated a green line for the humanitarian aid to the regions that are under the temporary control of Russian-led territories. Terrorists. The fourth issue is that you, that's true. It's difficult to cross the touch line. We name it as a touch line. But this is the national security issue. Uh, Russians, we don't have the border between Ukraine and Russia. And you know this is the part of the Minsk deal. And Russia is not willing to seal the border between Ukraine and Russia. It's just open. So they send their terrorists, they commit terrorist plots in different areas, in different regions in, of Ukraine to destabilize the situation. So I feel sorry for this, to these people that it's, it's difficult sometimes for them to cross the touchline, but we are doing our best to simplify the procedure on the one hand and on the other hand to have an iron grip over security issues. And uh, I strongly believe that the time will come when we will take over Donetsk, Lugansk and Crimea. This is Ukraine. Um, on the university issue, you know, the government together with the EU, we've subscribed to Horizon 2020 program, which is the EU program for billions of euros that have been promised. Uh, so the government already passed a number of bills. We made Ukrainian universities much more competitive and much more independent. Because we have two different types of universities. The first one is who is to print certificate and diploma, and another one is to those who can bring knowledge. Uh, <coughs> and uh, the line minister is in charge of this, so we already decreased the number of these so-called universities, so things are improving, and we've changed the way the budget subsidizes these universities, the budget uh, pays for um, uh, Ukrainian students, because 50% of Ukrainian students uh, actually subsidized by the government. So we are doing it, but, uh, you know, there is this distant education programs, uh, uh, launched by Yale, Princeton, and other universities. We have to attract professors from the outside world with the new knowledge, with the new vision, with a new type of education in order to educate uh, Ukrainian students. Uh, this, is, this is the basement. I always say that the, the best asset this country has is Generation I. I mean, Ukraine, Ukrainian youth. Generation I, which is intelligent, which is independent and which is internet dependent. They are so smart, uh, they, are, they are just better than we are. So we have to educate them and uh, this is the future of this country. On Budapest memorandum, let me just remind you that the, this memorandum was signed by the United States, UK, Russia, Ukraine, and then China and France joined. Uh, the problem is that this is not a legally binding document. Uh, under the Budapest Memorandum, uh, we can hold only so-called consultations. Three times we asked Russians 
to start these consultations and they already always refused. In this sense, we asked our partners, our friends, to support Ukraine and to make Ukrainian military durable and strong enough. Not for the offensive operation, and I want to be very clear, the aim of the government is not militarily to reclaim the territories, but the aim of the government is to deter Russia, to deter Russian-led troops. We are the only country who is fighting against the Russian army in the world. So we need support, both financial, economic, and military, in supplying of defensive weapon for the Ukrainian military. Ukraine is defending not only Ukrainian people. We protect the European borders too. So it's in our joint interest. Prime Minister Arseniy Yatsenyuk, thank you very much. Thank I, you. I know that you've just flown in today from across the Atlantic. You have a very busy schedule, so it's very good you've been able to spend an hour with us this evening. My pleasure. Thank you very much.